Welcome to Air and Space Warfighters in Action. I'm Orville Wright, President and CEO of your Air and Space Forces Association. It's an honor to be here in person with all of you, and thank you to many, many more of you who are joining us online. Our guest today is Colonel Christopher Chris Putman, the very first commander of U.S. Space Forces Central, which activated as a component of U.S. Central Command on December 2nd, 2022. Based out of McDill Air Force Base, Florida, Space Scent is focused on the continuous integration of space across Central Command's area of responsibility, which stretches from the Middle East to Southeast Asia. It is one of three Space Force components to stand up since the new service was formed, joining Space Forces Indo-Pacific and Space Forces Korea. Prior to taking command, Chris served as Director of Space Forces for Air Force's Central Command and Pacific Air Forces, as well as the Director of Future Operations for the U.S. Space Force, working for then Lieutenant General Sultan Salzman. He also previously commanded the 12th Space Warning Squadron at Thule Air Base, Greenland, among other assignments. Chris, Colonel Putman, thank you so much for being here. We have industry slides showing uh, on, the, on the monitors, and I also want to give special thanks to our sponsors who are listed on the screens flanking the stage. Without their, your support as industry leaders, warfighters in action would not be possible. So, all right, with that, let's uh, get to it and uh, give Chris a chance to talk about the incredible work he and his relatively small team do every day, probably 24 by seven. Space in is nearly four months old now. What are your biggest priorities as you continue to develop the component command? Sure. I, I think uh, I got three major priorities and maybe like three and a half, four. So I'll start with number one is support the current fight. Um, I, I think as most people are, are tracking Space Scent, the Guardians came out of AFSCENT. So we had a mission 24-7 uh, to support uh, CENTCOM through the air component. Um, as we stand up a new organization and do all the things it takes to uh, create a new organization, we, we can't can't drop the ball on the current fight 24-7. Um, you know, everyone's tracking of all, all the unrest in the Middle East and, and everything, all the operations that are going on in CENTCOM. So we have to continue to provide that support um, to CENTCOM. And now it's directly to General Carrilla uh, by, by through, through AFCENT. Uh, second priority is stand up the organization. Obviously, uh, we, the, we were given the, the authority to stand up the new organization and everything that goes with it. So money, manpower, our, our banning document facilities, everything that goes along with an organization. So we had no increase in manpower on day one. So support the current operations and stand up a new, new organization is probably my second priority. Uh, third would be international engagement. Uh, there's a lot of nations uh, in our combatant command that are very eager to get uh, involved with space. So uh, we, we need to take this opportunity to engage with them before they um, seek out uh, other other nations to, to to partner with, and we certainly want to be the partner of choice um, with with the with the nations uh, in, in our AOR. And I'd say the third and a half or the fourth priority is, in addition to all that, how how do we look forward to integrate into the the forward looking O plans and and other other activities OAIs um, that that U.S. CENTCOM is planning. So whereas before the space portion of an O plan may have been a tab to an index, uh, a tab to an annex in an appendix, uh, so buried somewhere in the back of a, a plan. Now we need to have our own concerted. What what is the space set support plan to the theater campaign plan, uh, and, and then across all the O plans. So as 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 we go forward as a combatant command um, and, and update those. So that that'd be the four priorities we have um, first and foremost. Perfect. That's a great way to shape the the conversation here for the next few minutes. Chris, you previously served as a director of Space Forces in the Pentagon, in the Pentagon uh, a job many of the people in this room in the audience are familiar with. How does your role then today um, as, your, as a component commander differ from the DS-4 position? Yeah, so, so I, I, I was fortunate that um, I was around when we had the very first director of Space Forces back in 2004, uh, CENTAP at the time, not, not AFCENT. Um, 
since that time in 2004 to till, till 2022, we've had 30 director of space forces um, in, in the CENTCOM AOR uh, of note of those 30, uh, three of them went on to become four-star generals. So I got to see the birth of the DS-4 construct. I was the last director of space forces in CENTCOM. So I'm glad that we put that in the past. And I was also the director of space forces um, out at PACAF for General Brown when, when, when he was the PACAF commander. So um, in all of that that I just described to you, where every one of those individuals was working for the air component commander, um, integrating space as part of air and space integration to support the combatant commander, um, supporting that that three star, four star, whatever the case may be. Um, now as a component commander, I work directly for the combatant commander. So I am a component commander to General Carrillo, just like all the other component commanders. I happen to have a lot less rank. Um, in, in CENTCOM, they're either a three or a two star general, but um, I've got to see at the table with, with all the rest of them. And we're providing best military advice and options to the combatant commander so he can uh, respond to the, the, um, the command authorities back, back here in the state. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of a different uh, angle that before we had a lot of uh, buffer between us and the combatant commander and, and checks and balances, but now it's a very direct line between my very small organization uh, straight to the combatant commander for providing him him options. Um, so same thing on the, on the service side, we've got as a component, we've got a direct line right back to the CSO and the COO um, for any support that, that we may need. Obviously we work through the staff, but, but um, again, as a component, we have that direct line back. So um, a lot of responsibility, uh, but uh, it's a lot, a lot of hard work and our guys are, you know, doing what needs to be done to, to meet those requirements. To put a, a bit more of a, a personal and professional perspective, um, Describe for the audience a bit, uh, when you're at a meeting uh, supporting General Carrillo as a colonel with multiple generals sitting around the table, and not just your AFSINT counterpart, General Grinkowitz, but you have a, a land counterpart, a maritime counterpart, I think a marine, a naval counterpart, a maritime counterpart. So if you could describe that relationship, um, my guess is you're fully empowered, if not needed, in every conversation, whether you're a colonel or a three-star general. It Yes, sir. So in addition to that, we have the CGTFOIR commander who's run, running the operations um, there um, in, in Iraq, Iraq and Syria. So it's more than just the services. You, you add the one more um, into that. So I, I will tell you at CENTCOM, we have been fully embraced as an equal partner. We may be a lot, lot smaller, a light, light, lot lighter on rank, but, but he looks to us all and he holds us all to the same standard. Um, the, despite the rank and the, despite the size, so uh, CENTCOM's been great. I mean, uh, they, you know, General McKenzie, who started the the demand signal, um, now moving forward to to General Carrillo. So um, it's daunting, but uh, it, it it's achievable. And he looks to us for our equal best military advice, just like he does all the other uh, all the other component commanders. And I, I think something something uh i don't want to say click but became very apparent that that we've been fully accepted it is over the past weekend we're uh preparing uh options and just doing some planning for the boss and one of the other component commanders goes this doesn't look right this really ought to be a space set controlled exercise he's the supported commander and he ought to have control of these capabilities um so i, I that put a smile on my face that that we were at that level of acceptance just like every other component that's a big deal space Sant as the supported commander in a CENTCOM exercise. Yes. Did I get that right? Uh, for a particular part, this yeah. particular action, we, we were, we were, we, we, we had the stick on that. Do you have stories you might share with us about the sidebars? For example, does your soldier or senator counterpart come to you and go, how about me? Uh, what, again, uh, neither uh, your sailor or soldier counterparts can do anything without you. Uh, yeah, I'd like to like to think that's true. Um, I, they come to us advice. They come to us for conversations. I I think the, the greatest thing was um, our current DCOM General Gio. He was previously uh, the Air Component Commander. So when we first started the whole um, planning effort for the stand up components, he was the Air Component, and he was hugely supportive. And the fact that he came over to be the DCOM uh, just lent itself to to a great transition. Um, so. Uh, 
you know, the, the air component definitely set the standard and, and provided us the support we needed uh, to get up and run. And, you know, and that's one of the basic tenets of standing up a space component is, is I think we're all tracking Space Force doesn't have lawyers or, you know, civil engineers or doctors or any of that support. We still have to wholly rely uh, on the Air Force and the air component, and we have to operate as a team. And if if we're not working together with the, the air component, none of this is going to work. And the support's just been uh, outstanding um, to date. That's terrific. Um, joint warfighting actualized is what I'm thinking. And then below your levels, you've got airmen and guardians, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, all in the fight together following your lead. Yeah, yes, sir. It, you know, I, I will add that Space Sun is just not guardians. Um, we have soldiers. Uh, work, working in the component. I have uh, UK working in the component. And I have Canada working in the component. So um, even though we're a brand new component, we are truly joint and combined uh, from the get-go. Terrific. Well, how does the stand-up of Space Sent advance U.S. partnerships in the region? Uh, you've alluded to that somewhat already. And what are some of the biggest challenges or opportunities really you have in that international arena, especially given classification levels? So so I think there's a great um, thirst for knowledge ac across the command. Uh, we have a lot of nations that see space and the critical combat enabler it is, uh, that it is and can be. Um, and they're coming to us for, um, for advice on how do I stand up a space force and, and what does that look like? Um, I just returned from uh, the, the AOR uh, on Saturday and we just completed uh, space 100 class in Saudi Arabia. So we gra graduated the first 100 space cadre uh, in in the uh, Royal Saudi Air Force, right? So that they're taking the first step uh, to train their folks. Um, but the challenge was, how do I teach space 100 at the unclassified level so that we can share it with our partners? Now we were able to do that, but it, it was a significant lift um, on how to do that. So going forward, what are those opportunities to share with our partner nations at either the unclassified or the rail level um, going forward so that we can actually have fruitful conversations and, and work together? And a, a lot of the answer may rely on the commercial side. So if we buy commercial off the shelf with our partners, uh, we avoid a lot of those security classifications, uh, roadblocks that have inhibited us uh, in, in the past. And, and Saudi Arabia is just just one example. We we have now that we've stood up as a component, we have a lot of requests from from partner nations in the AOR to have those types of conversations. Uh, do I need a space force? Can I integrate space with the Air Force? Can I integrate it uh, into another part of my DoD uh, equivalent? And we'll we'll talk with each nation. And we'll we'll have those discussions to, to help them figure out uh, what looks right for them. But ultimately, if we all work together, this is a this is a win for them. It's a win for us uh, going forward. Thanks, sir. You know, uh, many of us know and are big fans, certainly, um, the Air and Space Forces Association uh, tries to be a cheerleader for um, and be an advocate and reinforce uh, the pub reinforce public education on behalf of General Jim Dickinson, Jim Dickinson, and of course, Bill and John Shaw. In that construct, um, and across your AOR or when you're at McGill, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, that relationship, which I'm sure is evolving in space calm, uh, in space, uh, Space Center. Yeah, so we can't do our job without Spacecom. I mean, period, right? That they're they're you know equal combatant command like CENTCOM and all the other combatant commands. So I, I think I'll start with saying that you know the the beginning or the focal point of our integration is U.S. Spacecom has a liaison team at at, at U.S. CENTCOM. They call it GIST, Joint Integrated Space Team. Um, so it's a team of about, I think, five, five to eight personnel. So we, we don't do anything un unless we're talking together um, on, on, on space subjects. We, we meet regularly um, throughout the week. And in fact, wh whenever we have an office call anywhere in the CENTCOM headquarters, me and, and the GIST director, we as much as possible, we try to go together. To the discussion we're having right now, we can have the discussion with the J3 or the J8 to explain what the differences are between space set and U.S. Spacecom and, and, and where that, that support comes. So I will tell you, on the ground in Tampa, uh, we have a great re relationship. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think we're working through, or working to success on that. As far as lines of, the res lines of responsibility, um, you know, space that, for lack of a better term, handles the, the, the down and in, right? So 
any capabilities and effects that directly support US CENTCOM, we've got the stick on that. We're, we're the single space advisor to the, the combatant commander uh, and provide him advice. If there's a fight going on in the space AOR, that, that's clearly a SpaceCom uh, fight. And if that affects us, that's where we work with the GIST and back to SpaceCom to either request effects or determine how um, uh, the uh, operations in their AOR are, are going going to affect us in, in our combat operations or just day-to-day -day, day um, operations um, in our AOR. So I. I, I think it's a val valuable relationship, and at least within CENTCOM, uh, I think it's working working quite well going forward. Uh, I will tell you back to your previous question. Try to explain the difference between SpaceCent and SpaceCom to a partner nation. That becomes quite tricky, and, and frankly, we're not doing ourselves too too many too many favors by having those two different organizations because it, it's kind of a subtle nuance and, and a necessity for as large as our DoD is. But then you try to explain it. Um, to one of our partner nations, it becomes a little tricky, but but we're working through through that um, go, going forward, and I think that's one of the the biggest roles SpaceX can have going back to the partner nation engagement and SpaceCom is how do we funnel all those disparate efforts dealing with Saudi Arabia or Qatar or whatever um, into a single line so that you don't have twelve organizations coming at them from different directions. So I, I think we can help the fight in, in that particular way for sure. I would encourage you. Um, we win wars uh, with leadership, not with organizational charts. So, what occurs to me, uh, and I see over and over, and it's really almost a secret sauce for um, the new space force. Um, you all know each other very well. You and John Shaw and General Burt, who's the S3, all grew up together, uh, went to weapons school, and you know, a short phone call uh, between the two of you based on that trust and confidence of growing up together can be powerful. Um, and you're welcome to talk more about that. Uh, and just go ahead and brag about the terrific sisterhood and brotherhood we have across the Space Force, uh, starting with General Salton. Yeah, it's, so obviously, I, I, before I had this job, I was working at headquarters Space Force, and this was, this was General Saltzman's effort to normalize it. Hey, we're a service, and what do we do as a service? We have components. Um, I was fortunate enough that me and my team get the tag of figure out how to stand up components and, and go ahead and do those. And um, no good deed goes unpunished. So my reward was, hey, go run one of those things you designed. So um, I'm kicking myself sometimes on some of the decisions I made in the past, but but it's all good. We're learning and and, and we're going forward. So that, that support from the headquarters and General Saltzman has been uh, hugely beneficial and those tight tight ties right you know it's uh it's a short phone call either back to general bird or general saltzman um to 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 get things done i i would say the other key relationship here um going back to spacecom spacecom has a component too right so they're doing a bit of reorganization but they're ultimately going to have a component out there for space war fighting and that's my counterpart and right now it's roughly general chess so if I need something, I pick up the phone, send the email, and it goes out to him. And, and he's my counterpart at the component level uh, on the space comp side. And that, that's been hugely beneficial to, to have those conversations and have those interactions back and forth of um, trying to just get to the root of the problem and solve that. So um, I, I, and I look forward to once they're done with the reorganization, whatever that looks like and whatever that new component commander is, is that that component relationship between myself and, and General Chess or whomever it may be at, at that organization and the other component commanders, um, the ability for me to pick up the phone when we have a component in UCOM or call out to General Mastelier at Indo PACOM. This is what I'm seeing. Do you have any kit that can help support this or any personnel? Have those interactions just component to component and just get after it. Uh, it's been, been hugely beneficial. And, um, um, and I, I look forward to us standing up the rest of the components. Okay. Well, we're not looking for a commitment or a promise, but um, Dr. LaPlante uh, this week got a lot of questions. This past week got a lot of questions from Congress about how can we make acquisition of advanced, uh, really warfighting capabilities go faster. Um, we happen to know, I think, that uh, you work closely. And again, you grew up with General Group Line of Space Systems Command, and you're also more and more connected to commercial space opportunities. So 
as you stand up uh, really in Joint Warfighting Command, you're defining requirements every day. Are you interacting with industry, uh, space systems command, and commercial uh, space industry on a routine basis? Not right now, but that is definitely part of the plan. Um, I've got 10 inbound personnel this summer. One of my top um, requirements was I need an acquisition professional to come and work at my staff. In fact, the J8 at CENTCOM, he came and found me as soon as I got there and said, I need help with this. So uh, it's definitely in the plans. We definitely are going to start wor working at it, but I just need a few more few, few more folks on, on board. But um, we'll, we'll have an acquisition of uh, professional on board with us this summer, uh, and we'll continue to build that shop uh, within our 5.8 uh, to, to get that, uh, that expertise there uh, to work with industry. Well, great news for industry, uh, I would offer. Um, so we talked a little bit uh, about uh, your partnership, really, uh, counterpart, uh, Colonel to a three-star with Lieutenant General Grinkowitz, who was here last month. And he mentioned and emphasized the fact that since Space Forces Central stood up, space is already getting more attention and, it, and there is a cleaner C2 line for the CENTCOM commander. Uh, you talked about that somewhat, but can you elaborate a bit more uh, from your perspective? Yeah. So. We have done, with the existing people we have right now, um, and a new organization, a new tasking process, we've um, stood up our own tasking process without getting too far from the ATO cycle, because again, we didn't get any extra people. We're wholly reliant on the AOC for IT and, and weapons systems uh, support, um, et cetera. So, you know, what, what does the space tasking order look like? Well, at the very basic is let's draw a cut line in the ATO, pull all the space stuff out and, and, and call it the space task order. That will evolve and it'll get, get more detailed and more complex. But now we have a separate document that goes out to the space units that belong to the theater that precisely tasks them uh, to, to do uh, what, whatever's in support of the, the CENTCOM uh, OAIs. Same thing with the, the air operations directive. We'll have a space operations directive. We'll pull all the space um, material out of that um, so that anybody's got any questions, um, they can go straight to that document. And right now we're building a roadmap of what is the hierarchy of documents from strat to task look like for space sense so that folks can go find out where to go to like, you know, are we gonna have a spins? Yeah, it's gonna be called the space spins. You know, we'll have a space space operations directive. We'll have a, uh, a theater space coordinating plan. We'll, we'll have a multitude of documents. We're still in the process of defining exactly what that is, but but to the other components that previously just saw kind of a black hole with uh, and space was buried somewhere in the air component, now will be readily apparent exactly where where, where we are and where, where they can provide that support. Well, you're um, you're actually developing the training program every day uh, for Guardians of the Future. So um, as you and a number of your counterparts uh, went through the Air Force Weapons School together. Uh, now that's transitioning more and more, although certainly still saying the Guardians to Weber School. Uh, Space Training and Readiness Command, led by General Bratton, uh, now is embracing education and training, uh, probably tactics, techniques, and procedures development. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what you're learning and how you see that going forward in training uh, the next generation of Guardians at a, by the way, Web School graduate level? Right. Like your own. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think what we're learning is, you know, from a guardian perspective, you know, we probably have some room to learn and make up on the operational level planning. So whereas before you could send guardians to the uh, to the AOC and they could focus on their weapon system and just doing their little piece of the pie, now that we're a separate component and we owe best military advice straight to the combatant commander, we, we've got to fill in that gap, whereas before um, AFSENT may have filled in that gap from an operational level perspective. So I, I think we've got, I think we've got the tactics down pretty good at, at the very basic tactical level, but there's a gap in there that us as a service um, need, need to fill in and, and you know, how, how do we train that? And what's, what's the schoolhouse for lack of a better term to come up with operational level planning. Um, that's why I love having uh, army FGOs uh, on my staff. They know how to do operational level planning. It's, you know, Military planning's beat into them from from the get go, and I absolutely love it. So, um, you know, we we could learn a lot from 
not just the Air Force, but but the other other services uh, as well, just to get that breadth of of planning experience out there. I'd say the the other thing we're probably learning is how important it is that we need to have representatives and all the other components. And how do I get them smart enough that I could go go take a guardian and say, hey, you're going to go live in Bahrain for three years. Um, and work with the naval component. I'd love to do that once I get more people. Or you're going to go live live with our scent um, for a couple of years and, and live with those folks. So we'll have to figure out what's that training pipeline look like to get folks Army smart or Navy smart. Um, and I think in the long term, that's going to be great for the, the Space Force to have a guy that just spent three years with NAF scent or our scent uh, to come back and, and bring that expertise into the space staff or you know space combat. You know, great. It's visionary. What you're talking about really is it helps us all look over the horizon. Can we talk a little bit more, um, and certainly at the relative layman level, about your resources? Um, you have your, I know, concern, educated guess about precision navigation and timing. Um, in many ways, the GPS constellation um, is a nexus for the employment of precision guided weapons, and that's an ongoing planning, uh, if not employment operation every day um beyond pmt uh you know you connect uh, with isr uh and targeting so could you give us an unclassified overview of that um in your day-to-day -day operational role and probably goes right to the um uh, allegheny and the aac4 yeah I, I i think i'll lump gps and and satcom together so especially in our aor i mean it, it's a good good bit of distance between IED in Afghanistan or IED in uh, northern Syria, or you know, um, without GPS and without SATCOM, none of that is possible. And um, in the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, both of those are fragile signals. So whether it's intentional or inadvertent, it's very very easy to lose those capabilities. Um, so so what what can we do to um, protect those capabilities? Um, that are out there. So uh, it's working with our partners and all the other components. Like what, what are your requirements and, and how do we, how do we fill those? And, and do I have enough capacity um, on orbit? And, and then it's also an education thing of, you know, mo mo most widgets are made to be able to function with and without GPS, just we've forgotten how to use it without, without GPS. So, so maybe there's an education piece um, out there as well. Um, as far as the ISR front, you know, that that's, there's obviously a lot of capacity and capability out there, but that, you know, that's through, through the J2 channels. Um, so we, we work with our, our S2, um, you know, and all the other uh, LNOs that are there at CENTCOM to ensure that the combatant commander um, gets what he needs because, you know, we've, we've got all the, the, the various agencies out there that, you know, have a piece, piece of that. So uh, it should for ISR. It's just not space side. Or you pick up the phone and, and share a perspective with your good friend Greg Gagnon from TS2, and I know you know each other. And yeah. again, you know, there's a lot of power right. in yeah. that in that trust and confidence you have with the S2 and the Pentagon. Yeah, it, around a, a higher level of class we can get to there. Right, it, and that's where the the phone call back to the space comm and, and John Shess and his team out out, of, out the C spot of that's really our hub back into the space comm enterprise, and they have a lot of those. Uh, built built in relationships um, there that that we can leverage through through his team and um, you know our last three Intel professionals that we've had down at IED have all come from the from the C SPOC and what a wealth of knowledge knowledge and connections they bring when they come forward and then you know when they go back they bring that theater perspective so it's a, it's a pretty good symbiotic relationship to to keep keep that that rolling so um, yeah it's, C SPOC is a huge enabler for us to to reach into all those entities. Yeah. Um, well, could you talk about then a bit, um, just specifically uh, as much as possible, how industry can help you? Um, the broadly described, certainly acquisition system is there. Um, it's pretty cool that Lieutenant General Donna Shipton with all her space background is, is the, the deputy of the two. Uh, you've got Mr. Calvelli there now, um, and obviously, uh, the AQ himself, but um, straight to industry. Are there ideas on how industry can, can better support your fight? Yeah, I think a great place for industry is we do the partner nation engagement. Or what are those off the shelf capabilities that that are 
purchasable and readily available for our partners uh, across the AOR that they they can they can purchase and fly and and become uh, quote unquote a spacefaring nation, right? But provide capabilities not only to their their country but also something we can share and work with them on. So you know it's great that we did Space One Hundred out, out in the theater, but until we actually have something to work on, it's kind of it's PowerPoint deep, right? So if there's capabilities out there that you know. Um, w- whether it's commercial, um, commercially available space situational awareness that we can at least have a discussion and look at what's going on on orbit, or it's a commercially available space um, capability that they can buy, either you know either buy the whole capability or buy, buy a service um, from them. Um, that that would go a long way towards um, building partnership capacity of, of just something tangible that we can work with them on. Uh, to, to further their desires uh, to, to move forward in, in, in the space realm. Before we shift, uh, we'll get ready to shift to audience questions, but before we do that, um, you have a, a unique warrior statesman perspective for a very challenging, uh, dynamic, uh, dangerous AOR. Uh, the threats are real. Um, certainly, Iran, the relationships. Um, and as Iran continues to challenge uh, peace and stability in the region, um, your perspective on how to keep the peace um, in that part of the world uh, as a warrior statesman, as a space smart, very space smart senior leader, would be interesting, I think. And you don't need to go above your pay grade, but your perspective is, is really helpful, I think. Yeah, I, I think just having the conversations, I mean, the, the fact that we spent Spent two weeks in Saudi Arabia having those um, peer-to-peer um, d- discussions on things space can do, and that obviously leads to uh, be- better partnerships. In fact, we intentionally brought a couple very junior CGOs with us to Saudi Arabia, in addition to the folks teaching the classes, just to have those conversations at the at the junior levels of look, I've I've, I've got lieutenants deployed downrange doing space operations and, and this could be you too so um you know our goal is to have those conversations as much as possible um, both both at the junior level and then you know i'll, I'll handle the conversations uh at, at the senior leader key leader engagement level and i'll, I'll continue to have those um uh, move forward as, as much as much as they'll have us and much as opportunity uh, presents itself and you know, we, we talked about the priorities at the beginning as, as much free time as I have uh, to actually get around it and it gets all those places. So obviously it's not a quick trip to get to any any place over there, but um, we'll, we'll do the best we can getting around to all, the, all, of, our, all of our nations. Well, thanks very much. Tobias, uh, I think you have a question. Go ahead, Chris Gordon. And we need to get the microphone. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, thanks, sir. Chris Gordon, Space Facebook site. Um, one thing that differentiates uh, CENTCOM is uh, U.S. troops are engaged in active uh, combat. Um, so how does that, you have a lot of experience in other AORs and the Pentagon, how does that change your day-to-day? Because you may have to respond to a contingency and you don't have the luxury of time to figure something out. You you need to just provide a, something right away to the commander. So just how does that that change your day to day, given that you you've had experience in other places. Yeah. I, so the one thing we we have that I didn't have when I was the director of Space Forces out at PACAP is, um, but the folks that man our portion of the AOC floor. So we're still in the AOC at IUD. The portion of the floor where they sat is still where they sit now, and you know we call it the Space Operations Center, even though it's only a corner of the ops floor. But but those folks are twenty four seven and and they're rotational, so they're they're focused on the fight here and now 24 seven. So um, I, I've got folks that man the ops floor and I've also got folks that are deployed in the back shop doing, doing plans. So whereas, you know, when I was out of pack app, everybody was PCS out there um, and we had a normal battle rhythm. I've got folks dedicated 24 seven for the current fight. So I, I think it's kind of built in to handle that um, for, for the current operations. If I didn't have that, that built in, um, 24-7 note, I, I think I'd probably have to give you a better answer, but I think we're well set 
to, to respond to that. So, so my, my deputies downrange as well, right? So if I get a, if I get a phone call and I'm in the airport and I clearly can't answer the question, I'm like, Hey, call the deputy. He's downrange. He's 24 um, seven and get, get hold of him. I could just follow yep. up on that. Um, how does that affect uh, your relationship with, with the commander, with general Carrilla? Because uh, obviously you may need to talk to him on a moment's notice about contingency you need to respond to. Sure. And, and we do get those questions at, at a moment's notice. So, um, you know, he, he's a Tampa, I'm in Tampa. So, I mean, we, we have regular meetings and he engages with the commanders all, all the time, just on regular um, battle rhythm. But, but certainly if there's calls or questions, uh, you know, emails 24 seven, the phone's 24 seven, and, and we'll pick up the phone. We'll answer the question uh, wh whenever the need arises. Like I said, if, if I'm in a place that I can't talk classified, that's why I've got a deputy downrange uh, to handle that. So, but it's definitely uh, it's definitely a challenge with how few people we actually have in the space set um, organization. Because uh, you know, after me, you got my deputy, and then it starts getting real thin, and it drops off precipitously. Whereas the other components may have a a fair number of FGOs, uh, we just don't don't have that luxury. Uh, I've got three FGOs, and that's it, right? So. George. Sir, good morning. George Nicholson, the Global Soft Foundation. I got a question. Uh, General Wright was at a meeting with me last week. I'm at least suppose I guess General Salson was asked the question. And General Raymond has talked about some of the huge initiatives that your overhead command is talking about integrating commercial satellite capabilities, imagery, and everything else. But I think the question that was brought up from the audience. And he didn't really didn't address it. Maybe offered for you to address it, of saying, if you're using increasingly space-based capability for command and control communications for military operations or ISR operations, is there going to be a question on the legality or uh, impacts of using those capabilities? I am definitely not a lawyer, so uh, I I can't speak to the legality of that, but. Um... I'll tell you, commercial is a part of future warfare, especially uh, space as we go forward. I, I think we just, as we lease, buy, or acquire commercial services, I think we just need to work with our legal teams to figure out what, what right looks like uh, on that one. And the last quick thing, I think that General Berger had mentioned great last week about one of the most difficult things the Marines is getting old ideas out and getting you, I go back to a quote from World War II, where it was one of the field marshals that said, the more difficult things of getting new ideas into the military is getting old ideas out of the military. You talked about the education process. How difficult is, is it to go ahead and clearly articulate what you can do with current and emerging capabilities as, a, as opposed to what we did in the past? I was on the Iranian hostage rescue mission, and I look at some of the huge problems we had on that. I look what happened to us in the Song Te operation, getting an empty camp, what you could do uh, today. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the value of having component commanders being able to put their signature on a paper and clearly uh, articulate requirements and present present that to the to the leadership. So um, we we just um, uh, Colonel Lance, who's my counterpart in UCOM, uh, when they stand up the component, right? We we wrote a memo of as far as um, training, this is the the amount of support we need from uh, a reach back organization. So we're now able, with the authority of a component commander on behalf of the combat command. Uh, put put that in writing and to the proper authorities. So again, we could do that before, but we're buried in the air component, and there was a certain level of buffer there that weren't weren't didn't have the weight um, behind it. Um, but uh, to your point about burying old ideas, um, I mentioned that I was there at the beginning of the DS4 construct. I was the last DS4 in CENTCOM. It's amazing when I showed up last year how little has changed in 20 years of us conducting operations in, in the Middle East. In fact, I would almost posit that we've regressed in some areas because you know, the, the stress that OIF put on us made us focus. Um, there is so much opportunity for us to do things in new and exciting ways. And I, I know that's what General Saltzman wants us to do. Uh, as far as the kit we have and the people we have, we need to give them the freedom uh, to execute. And you know, obviously we've got, there's old documents and instructions and policies that have been around since the 90s that, that we need, need to fix. But, but now that we have a service, 
And that's the great thing about having a service focused on space is that we've got a champion to get after these outdated policies and fix them um, going forward. And you now have the inputs of components across all the combat commands and Spacecom for providing that input. So um, good things to come. Um, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, rudder deflect um, to, to get the right. Great. Online. Go ahead. Yes, we have an online question from Sarah Babcock. You discussed the unique relationships with Spacecom, CENTCOM, and where Space Sent sits. Sometimes, though, it's hard for people to understand how space is integrating into the joint force since we don't have, for example, a sea focused COCOM or a land COCOM. Is there something comparable in another domain or COCOM that you can help us with? Uh, you might look at cyber. Yeah, I think I think I think cybercom or maybe transcom might, might might be might be the analogy there that that is a different different command. But I, again, it, it's it's what what's the threat and who are they focused on, right? So, um, you know, seccom's focused on Iran and it's all things Iran. It's not all things Iran except space, right? Seccom owns the entire problem with within the department of defense and you know uh, the commander needs advice on, on all things so so that's why we're there and um to, to support him clearly u.s space has got a mission and it's 100k and above and they they need need to fight that mission right so i i think that's the difference there um the centcom analogy is a, a little more complicated because you don't have a service right that belong belongs to that so that that's where that doesn't quite hold um together but I, i'm not sure i answered the question because it's pr pretty tricky but i don't know if there's a follow-up on anybody on that one you might talk a bit more about i'm sorry doug go ahead uh let me ask this though while doug's uh, getting the mic um you know making sure that you have a, a resilient space capability obviously is depending on um uh, defending against uh, attacks from across the elect uh, electromagnetic spectrum, well defined, or cyber attacks. Um, certainly, there's a cybercom uh, collaborative requirement there uh, to ensure that your PNC networks are reliable. Uh, can you get into that in an unclassified level a little bit about defending uh, your networks? Probably not. <laughs> That's prob probably the easiest answer right there. Um, and I'd really have to phone a friend to, to get on on. Uh, to get the expertise on that one, but 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 that's where Spacecom and the Space Force come in is like we're, we're the downstream users of a lot of these capabilities, and we're planning on it being there, you know, and, and that's in the Spacecom and the Space Force side to protect those capabilities to ensure the the effect the effect gets gets downrange. So um, yeah, we we've got enough to focus on, and I'm trusting them to to block in their lane and, and support us there. That's actually a great answer. You're you're the most operational tactical level. The joint war fighting op level certainly and focused on operations, alliance partnerships, and, and really TPPs at the tactical level. But please, Doug. Prophet the Elephant, uh, Doug Rayburg, yeah, Executive Vice President, uh, AFA. Uh, obviously, the elephant in the room is we've had a lot of kinetic activity this, just this past week alone uh, with Iranian militias. Uh, rather than answering the specifics of how you respond, what I'm really interested in is uh, the future. And have these changed your perspective on, let's say, your, your request for forces for capability and the ability to not only detect, but also uh, take space-based uh, capabilities to the next level, almost that creative perspective? Yeah, I, I don't think the recent activity has changed our, our perspective. I, I, I would say that we continue to ask for more than what's available, so we've already passed that that threshold. and. You know, Space Force is still what may, maybe like fourteen thousand strong total, if you include officers, enlisted, uh, and civilians, and then you add the kit that goes with that. That there's just not not enough to go around, and, and we're working on that, and we're continuing to get bigger. Um, so I I don't think the recent events have, have changed what what we're focused on. We 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 know what we'd like to have, and um, it starts with people, right? You know, that that's part of General Carrillo's uh, strategic approach. People people, partners, and innovation, right? I mean, I, it all starts with, with having the best trained, innovative people look, looking for creative solutions. So, um, 
using that strategic approach, what we have on the ground right now, we're finding new and creative ways uh, to support the combatant commander, uh, wh whether that's whether that's CENTCOM or, you know, we provide support back to SpaceCom as well, and we provide support to UCOM and other combatant commands. So, um, yeah. Helpful. Tobias? So you said uh, people, partners, and innovation, and I'm going to ask you a three-parter. Sure. Uh, we have a question from the audience uh, asking us about uh, authorities that you need. Uh, I'm curious to hear about whether you get access to the talent and kind of experience that you really need when you're building your staff. And then uh, in terms of partners, you're reaching out throughout the, the, the region. You've traveled a lot in the region. Are your partners contributing to the space mission? And are you having, are they excited about having a, a closer relationship perhaps and better access to the kinds of capabilities that you can provide? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the second part first because I think I already forgot the first question. I'll have to come back to you on that one. But um, I think the partners want to contribute and they are excited about it. And, and frankly, having a component out there helps helps encourage them to start asking the questions and, and, and now they have, have a focal point. But um, we have yet, we're working on what, what is the best way that they can help help contribute. And, and we, like, like we started out, we're only three months old, four months old, right? So we're still trying to figure out what, what right looks like. So part of my trip here to, to the NCR is to, is to meet with um, the folks in S5 and SAP IA and, and the other agencies there to, to kind of level the bubble to figure out what right looks like um, going forward. Because they want to contribute, they want to be partners. Uh, I just don't have a good answer right right today um, on, on what that looks like. And I think the first question was, are we getting the people and experience that we need? Yeah, so um, I mentioned I've only got three permanent party folks on staff right now. Um, one of them's uh, me. Um, so uh, sure, we have the right right experience that we have right now. But, but, but going forward, I, I, I think we are definitely getting the support of the Space Force. We're going to expand the 10 permanent party this summer. Um, from what I'm tracking, we're going to get bills on, on all 10 billets. And just looking at, at the personnel we've got in, inbound, it's the right mix. I mean, we're still going to be single string on, on a lot of folks um, out there. But the first tranche this summer, uh, we're definitely getting what we need. It's, it's still not enough. And, you know, we'll work. And we'll increment each year and slowly build, right? The entire service is still standing up. I mentioned we're only 14,000 strong. We're standing up a whole bunch of new organizations. And as much as I like to think I'm the most important organization in the Space Force, it's probably not the case. Uh, we've got to share the wealth and, and, and spread, spread across the service. And then the last part was authorities. Do you have the authorities that you need? And if you could imagine authorities that you'd like to have that you don't have, what would they be? I think we have the authorities we need to get the job done, and I, I, I think we can defer the rest of that question for a discussion at another time. Other questions? Well, let me fill in while um, we've got a few more minutes. Um, I've always thought there was a terrific opportunity in the context of Secretary Kimmel's one team, one fight. Uh, and especially, I think, applicable to your theater and your experience of being a school graduate. Uh, are you thinking about or have you had the opportunity to, to get uh, to the tactical level with the Ford fighter or bomber crews and, and talk about how they look at their 24 by 7 reliability for certainly PP um, and targeting capabilities or use of leveraging commercial space assets for imagery, those, those kinds of things? Or and just jumped in the back of the Strike Eagle and gone for gone for a ride. Um, so I've not jumped in the back of the Strike <laughs> Eagle, but I, I did get my first arrested landing on a carrier uh, about a month and a half ago in a catapult shot. So um, thank you, NAVSEN, for that great opportunity. Um, yeah, it, it was great. Um, <laughs> um, but as far as engaging with the folks downrange, um, you know, without getting into specifics, whenever we, we have a report in our morning sit rep, um, I always ask the, my, my team, hey, did you pick up in the phone and call this AEW and ask them 
what, what this really meant and what they were doing and how you can help them um, solve that problem. I mean, it's just a switchology thing or is there really something going on? And I think there's, there's still an opportunity to, to, to do that education and help, help, help folks get the right, whether it's an AEW, whether it's a army unit, Navy unit. Um, Cause again, it's, uh, you know, all, all I know is my box doesn't work and I'm going to write it up as, as a problem. I'm like, well, let, let's get to the root cause and figure out exactly why this is working. So we, we are definitely, definitely doing that. And we're definitely having those conversations. That's huge. That, that's a big deal. Um, you, you make it sound like just a day-to-day -day way of doing business, but to, to have that kind of leadership and that persistent encouragement and collaboration to build that team, that, that really is one team, one fight, exemplified. Well, it, it's great. There's a lot of, lot of leadership um, downrange that's had a lot of exposure to the space mission area and just as they're uh, matriculating into senior positions uh, across the AEWs, um, you know, they understand the mission area, so it's not foreign to them. So they're definitely... Uh, receptive audience. I, I believe the next version of this is Mule Kozlov that, that you're going to talk to. Uh, we work together out at PACAP. We work together out at IED, and he, he definitely understands that. So as we get those types of leaders that have come up through the chain, it, it makes it a lot easier um, to have those con conversations. And, you know, hugely, you know, probably the weapons schools where a lot of that uh, cross-pollinization has come, up, come out. Well, that's terrific. Um, we're about to wind up. We have time for uh, one more question. Two more. We'll give you one more, Chris. Sir, I'm Tony McCartney, SBIR Advisors. Our, our focus is defense innovation, and we've seen some rapid adoption of capability through some of the existing task force task forces, like Task Force 99 for AFSINT, for example. Any foresight on partnership with those component task forces or possibly standing up an equivalent for yeah. Space Sent? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, you know, T task Force 59 with, with with NAVCENT and uh, 39 with RCENT and now 99 with, with AFCENT. Um, the original construct paper napkin um, design for uh, Task Force 99 had a guardian in it. Um, back to the original priorities, I've got to stand up a new organization. I would absolutely love to have a guardian in Task Force 99, but I just don't have the capacity to do that. You know, Maybe somewhere down the road as I build out to whatever my FOC structure is, I'll have enough folks to Give a body to Task Force 99, 39, and, and 59. We we spent made a couple trips up to NAVCENT to talk to the Task Force 59 guys, and, and there's a lot of work there to be done. You know, maybe if I can get an LNO up at Bahrain, they can work with 59 and, and some other folks. So, um, but but right now our entire organization is a X9 uh, Task Force because that, that's all we're doing is innovating and creating a new organization. So, I, I don't know what we called something nine. Or just nine. Chris, one more and then we'll wrap up. Well, I was gonna ask about the innovation aspect in the in the task forces, but um you've addressed some of that. But what ways are you innovating? Uh you may not have the, the guardians to stand up a specific task force, but are you empowered to experiment in any way and try out things that maybe other aspects of the Space Force cannot do? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly think we are empowered just it's how much bandwidth do we have and, it, and again it you know with, with both 99 59 and uh, less familiar with 39 like they carved out people to do nothing but do innovation um, it's operationally focused and operationally executed i i just unless it's in the course of the day-to-day -day operations i just don't have the bandwidth to carve out something something specifically different but i i, I will tell you the fact that we have space capabilities resident in theater that belong to the CENTCOM gives us a quite a bit of flexibility to create innovative TTPs that are um, uh, pretty innovative for lack of a better term. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of the work the guys are doing, doing downrange. It, like I said, it's, 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 it's guardians. It's primarily guardians and soldiers, but you know, like I said, I got UK and Canadians contributing as well. Well then again, thank you uh, to all those here today in the Doolittle building. Uh, sincere thanks for many of you who have joined online. Um, we, uh, your Air Space Force Association, remains absolutely committed to supporting our airmen and guardians and their families. It's been a treat, uh, Chris, to have you here with us and, and to hear uh, about your team. You're small but mighty, uh, Space Sent team. And uh, please uh, join us. Uh, we're back here. Uh, 
on the uh, 19th of April for our next Air and Space Warfighters at an action event with Colonel Joshua Koslov, commander of the 350th Spectrum Warfare Wing, and registration for that event is open and can be found on AFA.org. I have to say, uh, I know General Drinkowicz will watch this. It's been um, a gift for AFA and some old fighter pilot who loves space uh, to have both of you on the stage, two partners uh, in a tough fight. And, um, you know, truly for the two of you and your teams, as Secretary Kimball rightly talks about one team in one fight, uh, in a tough, demanding, dangerous AOR, uh, General Chris Putman, Lieutenant uh, General Alex Brinkwich, and your teams are keeping our nation safe. And we can never, never thank you enough. And oh, by the way, now that we know NAVSIM gave you a jet ride, I'm pretty sure there's a strike you were offering out there. <laughs> Uh, ha! Ho hopefully it's not with General Grinkovich because he'll he'll make me pay for it. Right? So, uh, Thanks. Please go ahead and wrap it up.